Greetings. Hmm. Would you like to hear a fairy tale? A modern day fairy tale. Are you sitting comfortably? Are you properly inebriated? Medicated? Imaginated, illuminated. Then let us begin. I'm going to tell the tale of a movie that was never filmed, which is more of a story than perhaps the movie might have been. It's a story of fairy tales, of the paranormal and of personal experience. The Quest for Calypso or A Modern Day Fairy Tale. That was the title. I'm going to give a bit of a preamble. DeMille must introduce his movie. Then I'll go through the script, as I have with other scripts of mine, such as Indiana Jones and the Throne of the Gods. Not reading it verbatim, but some of it, and giving a gist of what was going to be and why. Tell the movie that could have been, and its parallels with the paranormal, and most especially, most notably, Baron Trump and his underground adventure. And then thereafter I will hopefully answer some questions, tie up some loose ends, but not all. There are some elements of the story I simply cannot speak of. I don't dare. But I'll tell what I can since it's been told in bits and pieces elsewhere sort of scattered around so I'm going to put down in a book very 19th century 21st century an audio book <laughs> and you can make of the story what you will what could have been what might be in another timeline maybe future in this one who knows Not even I knows. He knows. All right. First of all, genesis of the story. Uh, early cons. I was always a fan of Halloween stuff, and I always felt Halloween didn't have a definitive movie. When Tim Burton Nightmare Before Christmas came along in 1993, that became my favorite film and held to such an extent that that was going to be, it was the theme of my fiance and I's apartment and was going to be our wedding. I mean, I got her a uh, Nightmare Before Christmas engagement ring. That should tell you something. And proposed in front of the castle in the northwest quadrant of the star compass there. <clears throat> right about when the clock would read the date we decided upon, 927 was going to be our date. Uh, so when we were in Hollywood and had lofty dreams, I, I was busy in the background while shining the shite of others contemplating my own stories just like Tim Burton back in you know his days at Disney and uh, this story was sort of a, a mixture of Alice in Wonderland and um, a typical dark dimension you know alternative world the idea was living under the Hollywood sign. I fancied the old-fashioned Hollywood land before the land was removed. And uh, I saw, like, if 
a little girl would go into a bookstore called the rabbit hole and there would be like a secret door in the back she would find like a secret bookcase you know, a Bruce Wayne type of you know revolving bookcase door or something the script went through many versions and um, and then she would go into this alternative universe where Hollywood land was Halloween land you just change a few letters it fits very easily Hollywood Halloween and it was sort of like a, a Nightmare Before Christmas type of world but mixed with Harry Potter where lots of humans walk around and very colorful you know lots of orange and black and gold very vibrant Nightmare Before Christmas is a bit too dark and twisted this would be a bit more happy like a, um, I don't know, almost theme parkish it, it would be uh, um, a Charlie Brown great pumpkin type of uh, feel but there would be dark corners of town you know LA's got its dark parts of town <laughs> Halloween land would have its dark parts of town that was the basic concept and teddy bears were always a part of it I didn't know about MK Ultra, Laurel Canyon, Stanley Kubrick at the time even though I was talking to everyone in the business not realizing what I was being told till I left town and put everything together um, after return after leaving LA for many occult reasons involving stargates and such around 2012 I had the you know at, I was at that crossroads of what do I do with my life and amongst other things was this expensive film school degree and I thought I still had a lot of friends in the business and connections I didn't realize how many were yet to betray me over such issues as I will talk about today um, including time travel Uh, I thought I'm done slaving for others. It's my my project now. I, I have I'm the only one that knows what to do right. And so I went through all the agonizing. Even though I was recovering from the loss of my fiance and everything, I was going through the agonizing process, which is hard enough, even with the support of your peers, which I did not have, to get a movie started in indie. And I got it. 90% of the way started the script of course went through its revisions I had some help from some AFI fellows and uh, but everything up here in the Northwest where I was going to film it obviously was you know my uh, groundwork I didn't really have any help with that now what was secured was all the locations the art department, the props, the wardrobe, everything physical was ready to roll. Casting is easy once you have that. People line up. And I had a few names cast. And uh, the idea was to film it in 2012 uh, autumn and release it in 2013 autumn for 13 Halloween. You know, that was the idea. What the script became because I was very flexible and just being creative and seeing what came along that I could work with and it became more a project of what do I have to work with and what sort of a cool story can I make out of it I, I like that approach I, I too many scripts too many other people's turds did I too many um, egomaniacs in Hollywood which is pretty much everybody or like this is my vision and I'm like well how are you gonna make this possible and then they just they they waste so much time money energy everyone else's time and energy trying to fit square pegs into round holes I'm just like well, let's look around we have ancient alien H blocks let's not bother with the square or round let's go with these H's like 88 miles per HH you know, 88 <laughs> anyway what I had to work with was plenty of pirate and medieval wardrobe from friends and family especially in the Renaissance costuming business I had a pirate town on a gravelly beach I had a small pirate ship I had a castle 
I had a fairy town. I had the you know the the locations around here are awesome. I had the old barn. I pretty much every lo uh, Stonehenge. We had Stonehenge secured down on the the river, the Columbia River, the border of Washington and Oregon. There's a Stonehenge, and we had permission to use it. We had dates set to film there. Um, everything was ready to roll, except that it wasn't just a movie. It was haunted. That's not so much to say bad or good, it just as um, as I will talk about, basically, it wasn't meant to be, or it wasn't allowed to be, because, I dare say, Baron Trump had to save that one, that card to be played on this cosmic, uh, great cosmic game we're all involved in. And I was warded off by no less than the villain's own antagonist, the Hat Man. As to how I was warded off, I'll save that more towards the end. That's the loop, some loose ends to tie up, but the teaser, if you dare keep turning these pages, so to speak, if you dare watch the movie in my mind, if you dare listen to my fairy tale, quite modern day fairy tale. We're going down the rabbit hole, and lines between reality and so-called fiction will be blurred. We're in the Matrix, folks, and that's what this movie was intended to be. The Matrix for children. Willy Wonka and the Ch Charlie and the Chocolate Factory has been described before as Dante's Inferno for children. I like that. That's what I was going for here. And it turned out I... To borrow from Pee Wee, I don't need to see it, Dottie. I lived it. Quite literally. Right, little Baron Trump? Strap yourself in because Kansas is going bye bye. Alright. Um, let's get into this movie proper. The Quest for Calypso, or A Modern Day Fairy Tale. Scene 1, Exterior, Night Sky, Goldwater, Washington, Halloween. The moon is rising, the universe is boundless. It is dusk, Halloween night is just beginning. You can do credits over this, or whatever, credits in the clouds, or going Tim Burton through a cemetery. Add the UFOs if you like. You could make it comical and fun. Do a Great Pumpkin type of credits. You could even have the Great Pumpkin go by in silhouette. And instead of E.T. going before the moon, you could have, like, Great Pumpkin go in front of it. There's, there's Snoopy's doghouse or something. You know, he's chasing the Red Baron. The Red Baron goes in front of the moon, and Snoopy's behind him. You see a triplane, and then the... Uh, doghouse something like that anyway scene two interior zelda's room halloween twilight same scene we begin with inserts okay i'm going off script here because there's too much to read it'll take five hours to read all the details i'm like terry gilliam i like to put lots of details in the script as an art department guy to say this is what i see in my mind i don't limit the creativity of people as you will see but my scripts tend to be thick. So, uh, I'll spare you a lot of that. Anyway, uh, we had inserts of the journal. It's, uh, quote, Calypso and Zelda's bellatoristic journal of daring adventures into the old worlds. Very 19th century subtitled. It's a, it's a scrapbook and it's made, handmade by our protagonist, Zelda, which was always a placeholder name, but I could have used it in the final. No one else really liked it, but I did. And it's um, a young girl. The age was flexible, 7 to 11 years old. And she flips through the pages. You could do the credits on this as well, or blend them. And uh, we see lots of hand sketches that she obviously drew. 
maybe progressing as she got older and she's been drawing these her whole life and we see everything that's to come in the movie if you look closely and it's at the same time her confessions of what's going on now what's going on to spoil it for the audience sorry or that won't make much sense she's about to have a uh, sort of a Baron Trump underworld adventure but it's not literally an underworld it's a matrix or a UFO abduction she will go into a barn on Halloween night and she will step in into Wonderland basically down the rabbit hole and everything after that is a sort of a screen memory imposed by I was never gonna say this in the movie but this was the subtext in my mind I would let people make of it what they wanted but my guiding principle was she stepped into sort of the fairy realm where they give you an illusion of what's going on based on what you think or believe people seeing owls or whatever or people seeing fairies or aliens or whatever they disguise themselves as based on your consciousness your experience in this illusion we call reality and so we show the book at the beginning with her own sketches this is what she has seen and come to believe with she's had obviously alien experiences or whatever her whole life she's seen them out the window maybe she's been abducted maybe she hasn't but she like so many children draws pictures of them but she's very sophisticated and she lives in a rather repressive technological world with planes roaring overhead and smoky noisy cars up front anyway we flip through the pages and we see things to come yeah things to come like the smoky noisy neighborhood but I'm getting ahead of myself we see she draws herself because she also hand stitches her own costuming and that's what she's wearing all the time through the whole movie her wardrobe doesn't really change and um, uh, we see drawings of her cat dragon which is Calypso and it's a half cat half dragon stuffed animal that she made sort of like Calvin and Hobbes and she sees him as alive even though he's literally just a stuffed animal and I think that's I dare say what Bill Watterson of Calvin and Hobbes was going for Hobbes wasn't really a stuffed animal that came to life as some people took him as but it was Calvin's perception of reality versus everyone else's more lame perception of you know quote-unquote reality and I was going to take that much more literally where since we are in a matrix now in a post 2012 world we can bend reality uh, to her Calypso is alive she draws inspiration from it some would say she's crazy but that's their view of reality you see they would also say there's no UFOs and no hat man outside your window but my own mother can testify from 1953 that those things happen uh, in the background of the drawings in the book we see uh, of course hat man and a lot of the scenes that are going to come in the, in the movie to come anyway we finally get an angle on Zelda she closes the book it's time to get ready for Halloween she's already ready and her wardrobe is sort of a witch black and orange and uh, she doesn't need to dress up for Halloween she dresses up for Halloween every day at school Halloween's like the one night she's gonna be normal and blend in fine uh, she look oh, okay she closes the journal she looks around uh, we see some other things in the room that are sort of like time bandits where every th all the toys of uh, uh, Ke um, Kevin the the boy we see at the end in the battle with evil like the the checkerboard and the Legos and everything and I was gonna do the same thing here and we see teddy bears Stonehenge built out of Legos um, the pirate ship and Egyptian like stuff pyramids and onks or things uh, a robot dinosaur maybe Grimlock or with the um, um, Dinobots uh, some Native American talismans UFO trinkets maybe a UFO lamp lava lamp that sort of you know she's like a hippie at seven or eight years old or eleven years old um, dragons, fairies, things like that. Uh, Harry Potter books probably be on the shelf next to Lord of the Rings and everything else. 
Um, but she makes everything she can, hence Legos. You know, she builds, she draws, she sews, she creates, she has a vibrant spirit. She relies on the internal, not the external. That's key to what goes on in both this movie and Baron Trump's uh, underground adventure. Um, anyway, she's looking out the window and she asks Calypso, Do you think people really live on the moon? And and Calypso will have actual voiceovers, and Calypso is going to be a puppeteered stuffed animal for the most part, which we did tests of and turned out to be quite easy to do. Uh, a puppeteered uh, stuffed animal just works. It, it worked well in testing, so, uh, and you just get a voice. And the voice that I had lined up was the voice of Binks the Cat, uh, Marsden, Jason Marsden from. Uh, Hocus Pocus and the voice of uh, young Goofy because I had worked with him in 2011 on Space Guys in Space which was a live action thing he wanted to get some live action non he was you know he didn't want just voice acting on his resume so he took any live action he could get I built the spaceship set so I got to hang out with him for a week or two we also had Mary Votava show up on that uh, who was important to me and we had, um, um, for one day, Green Lantern, because Marsden from Justice League was, vo you know, Green Lantern voice. We had, uh, it was a cool little thing. So anyway, uh, Marsden was open to doing the voice of, uh, oh no, he wasn't going to be the voice of Calypso. I'm sorry, he was the voice of Flint the teddy bear who shows up a little while later. The main stuffed animal character. Oops. Spoiler. Well, you saw his name in the credits, so you always know he's coming. Anyway, Calypso will have a voice, and uh, being half cat, half dragon, maybe a female voice, maybe, you know, maybe a Milo Yiannopoulos would be an interesting voice. <laughs> or a, uh, I don't know, it could be an old voice, like, uh, or a radio voice, like, you know, like uh, John Wells, or if he was still with us, Christopher Lee, you know, some... The voice could be anything. This is one of those things where I was totally open, uh, trust a casting director, but would have to play with the actress cast for Calypso, or I mean for Zelda, whatever her voice was like. You'd want them to have chemistry. Um, and Calypso is always like Hobbes, the voice of wisdom and her better sense, her conscience, so to speak. Half cat, half dragon. I don't know what that is. I leave that to the prop master and put the most time on this prop because this is the MacGuffin. This is the, the main prop, you know. Um, I don't know if that means hairy or scaly, colorful, single color. I don't know. I'd have to see lots of concept sketches. And I did have, uh, if you listen to my testifications, whom I termed the lady in black was doing concept sketches and uh, we had a pitch book and everything anyway uh, Zelda's wondering if people live on the moon and uh, Calypso looks up and makes a comment about it's into ufology even I wonder if it's real or, or, or I wonder if it's even real you know that sort of thing we're just teasing where we're gonna go in the finale And Zelda, school never talks about it. Grown-ups never know a thing. Books are, you know, just books. You know, you can read text, but there's no truth, and so she has to make her own books. Calypso has a bit of a Hobbes moment. Well, of course, if cats were in charge of the sciences, you know. Oh, hush, and they have their little banter going on. They hug, and... Um, he purrs, he gurs. He snorts little puffs of, uh, I mean, dragons, I think, would purr. Dragons have to have a purr. And it's a cat, so it works. Jokes about butterscotch cannonballs to your liking, and gummy pirates, Halloween candies. Um, trick we hear trick-or-treaters outside the window. Okay, they got to get ready. To make a long story short, uh, 
We have brief scenes with the parents and the kids in the neighborhood, and it's very time banditsy, very Harry Pottery. I'm going to skip through several scenes here for the sake of uh, pace. She tries to go, you know, she's like, she has no friends, and she tries to hang out with the kids, and she's not, since she always dresses weird at school, like Lydia from Beetlejuice, I guess, would be another uh, archetype, although Lydia was a bit older. This, we're thinking third, fourth grade, Stranger Things level, at most, at oldest. And we brief, we lose the parent. I mean, she. We just get a f several scenes. We're up to scene nine now, of her just being a fish out of water. She, she doesn't follow the pack. On she's the last in the pack on trick or treating. Her parents are just kind of not there, like the Dursleys or like in Time Bandits, how they're just into the game show and ignoring uh, everything important. And that's where we see a bits of the police state world that I felt was necessary to the script. Not just because I was digesting Bilderberg and everything for the first time around 2012, but I was, uh, I knew it was important somehow. This wasn't going to be Victorian repressive, it was going to be modern day repressive, so children could identify with it. For instance, Zelda is the only one in school who doesn't have a cell phone, she doesn't believe in him. Uh, like myself, but they say, write what you know, so it, it comes from the heart and it's true. And that's why she has more of an active pineal gland. She hasn't corrupted it. She still reads books and draws pictures and has contact with entities in other realms. She doesn't see dead people. She sees alien people. She sees shadow people. And no one believes her, so she draws pictures. Um, anyway, they finally get to the main event of the evening, which is her parents' friend's house on the edge of town, which is like the Halloween party of the school where... Now she's going to be tormented by everybody because everyone's in one place and she's now the fish out of water in a, in a larger pond. And the house we had to film at was out in the Puyallup Valley. Pure, pure Charlie Brown house. It's an old brick house. It's like 100 years old. There's nothing around it but like a, a farm with a river nearby so we get natural mist. It looked awesome. Close friend of the family. For those who know me, I'll just say Captain Lafitte. It's his house. So we could have filmed there with, you know, total, pretty much do what we want, no, no worries. And if you're a filmmaker, you know when you have personal friendship with an awesome location, that makes the, the show go so much better, because you don't have to worry about pissing them off or getting shut down or anything like that. You can just make, you can make art. <clears throat> Now, when we pull up, we also had access to an old Model T black car from, like, you know, vintage 1920s. Now, this is important because we're about to introduce our antagonist. When Zelda gets there, she pulls up, and there's many cars because it's a party, and we see the music, and, you know, there's outdoor and indoor party going on. It's a Halloween party for kids. It's, it's Lucy's Halloween party from, from Charlie Brown with the bobbing frapples type of thing. We might even get a beagle. <laughs> we have Snoopy in the background here. We'll put a little red doghouse out there on the field, just a or in a crashed. Uh, actually, that would be a cool little um, teaser for what's to come, interdimensional and things becoming real. That we could put a crash. Someone could show up at the party as an undead red bear and say he crashed and Snoopy got him earlier. Yeah, <coughs> and that sort of teases that things are just going to get weird. And she's, Zelda is afraid to enter, not just because of the kids. You get that, but then you get there's something else. She's afraid to cross the road, like it's a, you know, the threshold of adventure. And she looks both ways across, you know, she's an obedient little girl. And there's no one around. It's, you know, the party seems like a mile away, even though it's only across the street. And she's like, Calypso, do you see him? You know, and, uh. Calypso, no sign of him. Calypso is afraid as well, so we know this is serious. Calypso, who's always, up till now, just been like, oh, don't worry about these kids, they're just bullies. You, you're better than that. Now Calypso's like, you know, right with her. So you know there's something real that they're afraid of. So they, they get across the street, and just as they're getting across the street, I'd leave this to the cinematographer and to light and smoke and whatever, um, the old Model T pulls up. 
and we don't see the face but we see maybe the boots like uh, Dracula getting out of his carriage we the hat man makes his first appearance and he just stands across the street watching Zelda enter the party you now the hat man people have heard about in lore but I was making him a combination of so many primordial entities and to even talk about him I think I I need to have a smoke the hat man is a terrifying entity a lot of people in the paranormal talk about him these days I don't give an identity to him but I will say Hat Man is real and sort of shadowed my whole life. I mentioned my parents, or at least my, my mother in 1953. Well, both my parents were born here in Tacoma. I'm all, we're all local, we've lived here our whole lives, except for my time in LA. Um, they were both born in 47, and it was here in Tacoma that the men in black first showed up in modern ufology in 1947, with the Kenneth Arnold and Murray Island uh, goings on. So goes the legend. My mother clearly saw him uh, w along with her sister when my mother was six years old, and they fled out of the room. He was outside the window or something that they just a, a, a tall man all in black with the wide brimmed hat okay uh, and they told it to their my mother uh, her upbringing was very rough she was the youngest of five three older brothers one older sister mother died the same time age five six I think age six so this would have been the same year, same window, ha-ha, of time. <laughs> time is an illusion. And um, the stepfather was thus left with a new marriage to a wife who suddenly died of cancer. Fuck you, Hearst and New World Order, for your repression of cannabis and your poisoning of the culture. So this does have deep undertones to that police state that Zelda's parents are kind of wrapped up in, like the Dursleys or Time Bandits, watching the game shows, Big Brother's got them, you know, it's, my parents are fine, but I'm, you know, going back in time here, time's an illusion, it's just flipped the books on the shelf. Uh, the stepfather, who was thus left with this incredible burden, did a lot of drinking, had a lot of PTS because he went through the war, and he was fighting, pardon my language, those damn Japs, until he died of cancer in the 70s, around the time I was born. And, synchronously, the same facility same building same parking lot where in 2014 15 I watched someone dear to me who was part of this project waste away from cancer the princess of the castle I'll get into that more when we get there, because we were going to use this location. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what my mother and my aunt Donna saw freaked out their stepfather, who had been through the worst of the war. You know, he'd been hand-to-hand -hand fighting, knife fighting to the death, and he had his beer, he had his PTS, you didn't mess with him. My mother's siblings, all four of them, routinely were getting abused, 
I don't mean sexually, I mean physically. I mean, if you only got a whooping with a belt, you were lucky. Generally, you step out of line, you could look forward to losing some teeth. The point is, you didn't disturb this man with nonsense like the boogeyman outside the window or you were looking to be bloody and bruised for weeks. This guy, who had seen the worst of the war, was terrified by this incident. First of all, the window, he, he knew fear. And he knew that my mother and uh, my aunt were not fibbing. They were terrified, and he could see it in their eyes. He took it seriously. And they were terrified enough of the incident to not even think about not telling him. They had to tell him. They weren't afraid of a whooping. <coughs> the window was... <coughs> excuse me. Is one of those sloping side yards, so the window was too high off the ground for a normal man to be standing there. He would have had to have been eight, nine feet tall, if you can picture that. Gene, the stepfather, went out there, looked around. I mean, he investigated. He was that convinced someone was there, but it was also a physical impossibility unless the guy had a ladder and then ran down the street with it. But where this was, out in farm country... <coughs> He couldn't have gotten away before they would have seen him. You know, down the street, it's not just the next house over. you got to go a quarter mile or so before there's a tree to hide behind. This was old 1950s Puyallup Valley, Washington. Not very crowded. Scared the hell out of him. And seems to have followed me in some form or another, haunted me my fantasies, my stories, and apparently a lot of other people. This shadow entity with the hat. Almost as Belloc might say of Indiana Jones, a shadowy reflection. Couldn't help that one, it's the hat. <coughs> hat man. <coughs> When he first appears on the road, the only direction I would probably give to the uh, cinematographer would be, we don't see his face. We can see anything else, but pref preferably silhouette. You know, like Undertaker showing up at the uh, entrance before he walks down the ramp to the ring in wrestling. So many archetypes of the Hat Man I have intuitively loved my whole life been drawn to, like a moth to a flame, a dark flame, Montauk Black Sun perhaps. When Undertaker, Mark Calloway, first showed up, it was actually the first pay-per-view I had. I got into wrestling in mid-1990 and the Survivor Series 1990 was the first pay-per-view that I was waiting week after week to watch. And um, then, of course, that's where Undertaker first shows up. And I, as soon as he showed up, he became one of my favorites. Even though it took the wrestling world a little while to catch up, it was like, yeah. So far, so much so that I instantly made him one of the prominent characters. In um, There were other influences, but that sort of cemented it. And those other influences include Judge Doom, from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, whom I, I'll say I... I had some close brushes with when I lived on the edge of Toontown in Los Angeles. I lived underneath the Griffith Observatory and jogged through that tunnel all the time. That is the tunnel that leads to Toontown, where they filmed it. Same tunnel Marty McFly gets the Gray's Almanac back from Biff through ascending through the Rainbow Tunnel. And the same tunnel that uh, Page Master uh, goes through. Um, before he meets Christopher Lloyd, of all people, Doc Brown, Judge Doom, beyond the Lion's Gate in the library, and goes through the Kyber Stargate, the eight-pointed compass. Underneath the grip, the real Griffith Observatory has the green octagon roof above that same location, where the pendulum says 42, the curve of the rainbow, the rainbow bridge, the rainbow tunnel, the ascension tunnel, illumination. Got pineal? Twin Pines Mall. Turn it upside down, 11 Stranger Things, and, you know, 9-11 turn, turn the world upside down. 
Twin Pines becomes Lone Pine. Get it together. Use that pineal between both halves of your brain. Between, as Moses, or not Moses, but one of his followers would say, and Cecil B. DeMille would make sure was in the Ten Commandments, in between God's nostrils. Access the matrix. Anyway, sorry, having a little bit of a, a hat man uh, PTS there. Many influences of Hat Man, um, Undertaker, Judge Doom, Personal Accounts, uh, Phantom of the Opera. As soon as I, in 1996, sidebar here, uh, I was in London, happened to have a chance to score some good seats and tickets for Phantom at Her Majesty's. No Crawford, he was long gone, but it was still the original sets. And wow. I became a Phantom fanatic and saw it many more times as it toured the United States. Never as good as Her Majesty's. For example, at, on a, in a fixed location, Phantom Red Death vanishes into the floor through a trapdoor, whereas on tour he just throws a puff of smoke and runs away. <laughs> but when you see him vanish into the floor, it's much cooler, especially when you're up on the mezzanine and you've got a good, good angle of it. Front row mezzanine. Anyway, uh, Hat Man. I wanted to make him sort of a, a combination of all these things. He was an archetype, so I wasn't doing Hat Man literally. Although that was the working name. We might have come up with a different name, but there were some good joke lines in the movie. But I, I just wanted the that shadow that had haunted me my whole life. And um, I put red goggles on him. And I was going to have an actor cast who was both tall and disproportionate in some way. Whether longer armed, big chin, big head, you know, something weird about him so that there would be some, something alien to him that you couldn't quite place. Uh, anyway, so he watches Zelda go into the party and it's, a, as I said, it's a Halloween party. There's jack-o'-lanterns. Uh, the adults now are cutting loose. They're getting sauced. They're drinking. They're away from the police state enough where they can do their dirty stuff that's not on the blacklist. So you're seeing Zelda more and more separated from the quote-unquote real world. The important theme being the internal versus the external. She has the light inside of imagination, real spirit. Everyone else relies on their drugs, their technologies, their cell phones. Everyone's on their cell phones at the party. There'd probably be a good scene where she'd be like trying to talk to people, finally open up and want to talk, and no one responds because they're all texting to each other. And they're like, they text to each other, she doesn't have a phone, she can't talk. It's almost like Fahrenheit 451 or whatever, you know, a writer, a writer, you know, or who, whatever the story was, you know, you're, you're, writing is not a profession. People would think that Zelda can't talk because she doesn't have a texting device in her hand, you know, but she'd be like speaking right to their faces and they wouldn't be hearing her. That could be a powerful scene. And her parents nearby are like uh, Peter Pan, you know, they're off to the show and they don't give a crap about, you know, what's going on. That's important because the parents will show up to play a dual role like uh, Peter Pan's, uh, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the Darlings. Uh, the same voice in you know Disney version the voice of uh, Father Darling is the voice of Captain Hook because it's kind of that surreal world they go into and that's they'll be later on the king and queen of Halloween on the moon that's the same characters in the finale of the film uh, anyway Zelda's looking around um, bowls of candy discarded <laughs> yeah, um, we see a black cat we have this wonderful stone wall at a perfectly low height that a little girl could get on her tiptoes and peek over. We have a black cat wander along, um, just as an omen. Maybe you couldn't get it to work. It doesn't matter, you know. Don't work with children and animals, especially together. If we couldn't get the scene, we couldn't get the scene. Yeah. And uh, enter. Uh, the owner of the house, which could be cast as anyone, and um, he's sort of like, I was picturing like the old guy, maybe a Native American, or just something to give that sagely advice, just 
just like in Baron Trump, you know, you had uh, Don that would give Baron Trump the book and the advice, and so he had sort of foreknowledge of some things to deal uh, on his journey ahead. In old role-playing games, one element that I kept alive, even when the industry forgot about it for decades, was getting rumors and legends at the tavern. You always go to some crazy old bastard at a tavern, and he tells you all kinds of weird things in his own way that may or may not make sense until you apply them to the real paranormal experiences, and then you're like, oh, oh, oh. And just like in Baron Trump and other uh, Victorian literature, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, there's always that, someone's been here before us, and we're carrying on the story, and then you will carry on the story. Chester Copperpot in The Goonies. And uh, in this, I teased this character, the owner of the house, to be that guy who'd like... He looks across... We had this wonderful old barn across the field that we had total control over. And we were just going to have it lit from the inside. And it's like, you know, it's like, is it haunted? Is there, say, an alien UFO or something in there? What's in there? And she's looking over the wall, tiptoe up on her tiptoes, looking over the wall. And what's this light? And the old guy's like, stay away. Don't go over there, you know. And uh, you get the idea. Maybe he did as a child. And now she's about to go on the same journey of self-discovery that he did. He, I, I, The original draft of the script, I admit, was a bit... Um, well, I, I, I almost plagiarized The Shining with Scatman Crothers. You know, he's the guy that had the shine to him. He could see things the others couldn't see. And he was trying to tell it to the little girl or little boy. In the You know, Lloyd. Lloyd meaning the messenger back to Christopher Lloyd, which is why he's always that character. Zeus. Doc Warner Von Braun. <laughs> the Stargate opener, the light bringer. Anyway, uh, Lloyd... Um, in The Shining, is you know he shines, he's illuminated, he's got he sees uh, things others don't see. So this could have been a Native American. I think the original script was a black guy, and I actually had a friend who worked at Western State who was black read it, Western State Mental Hospital that is, uh, and he uh, he he told me that it's like you know this is a bit. He didn't say racist, but I got it, so I, I changed it up, and then he went through many revisions, Native American. Uh, just anything could have been for the flexible the point is he had the wisdom and he sees Calypso he takes it ser he takes Calypso seriously he addresses Calypso like a, like a real person you know and so he gets Zelda's respect and then uh, then he tries to get her some uh, like, you know, give your parents a chance, you know, they've just kind of lost their way, hinting that she's wiser than they, and, and she's undecided because the beginning of the movie, and she has to have some internal struggles to overcome, you know. And she's sort of, he's trying to help her come of age, but also knowing she might be off on her Wonderland adventure. And so Zelda cradles the her cat dragon, Calypso. She's really, you know, what do I do? What do I do? And that's where she gets her confidence. The one external thing is Calypso. And then uh, the old guy kind of walks, he just walks off and leaves her to think. And she sits on the wall. We could get all kinds of shot of her pacing on the wall. Whatever. Charlie Brown and Linus, you know, kind of hanging out on the wall there. <laughs> the, uh, she could be there with Calypso or Calvin and Hobbes, doing Calvin and Hobbes things, kind of walking around. Maybe wandering a bit too far into the field. Um... Now, I must say, the owner of this house, being who he was, Captain Lafitte, had well decorated the place to be incredibly interesting. Uh, he was into pirates and all sorts of things. So it was like a Goonies uh, house. I mean, in his, in his old house, he literally had secret passages and a captain's quarters under... So it was so good, we filmed some things in it. And people didn't know it was not a ship... So uh, there was an interesting gate, and you could go out into the field, the misty field, and sort of drawn to that barn that's illuminated from within, which was subtly a pyramid with an illuminated top window, which was the pineal gland, which sort of calling to her, calling to the audience, calling to everyone involved in the story, the experience. 
Creek, scene 11. She leaves. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. I guess as we're leaving. Exterior, Mason property. Since the house is made of brick, I called the house the Mason house, and I guess that's a subtle nod to the lodge. Except I wrote this back uh, when I was not a Mason, so... Hmm. Seeing things to come. I was thinking a Masonic Lodge. Didn't think I'd end up being one. <laughs> I didn't count on Baron Trump coming along either and trumping my Calypso story. I guess I just liked the old man at the fence. I've been there before, and you will take the journey yourselves one day. <laughs> Creek, the gate opens and out. Zelda wanders a bit too far from the party. Not that she has much inclination to stay there. And at the edge of the misty field, uh, uh, she starts to wonder oh, are we safe? Are we really safe? Um, there's a scarecrow I was thinking very much Tim Burton uh, Nightmare Before Christmas Jack Skellington type of scarecrow that would sort of be an ominous with a black hat on it that would be the key thing it would, a reminder that the hat man is out there and it creaks in the wind and but she's drawn to that light in the barn what is it? And then she enters the, I'm going to skip over, I have a lot of dialogue here, and I can't act for, <laughs> um, not with my raspy throat, that is. I'm not going to try and do a little girl. I sound more like Arnold Schwarzenegger, a little girly. Um, She's talking to Calypso, clutching her stuffed animal as she dares pass, you know, the field and walks through the mist and the, the party's just a distant glow. And the light of the door, like the doors of perception, it's open, it's ajar, she can, she can enter. And then she enters, and what a wondrous place. We're all building it up as this creepy thing. But inside it's like Christmas, Santa's workshop, colorful wondrous or or better yet more like maybe the uh when mikey first comes into one-eyed willie's cabin in the goonies and it's just that magical layout of treasure and perfectly lit with shad you know cgi i hate green screen so much because when you build an actual set a pirate's captain's room with the treasure there and you get the right lighting on it and the luster of the gold and and the glinting in, of wonder in the child's eyes as he strolls past it, and then he comes face to face with one-eyed Willie. Now, you could take that some ways with, speaking of Kubrick and teddy bears in Hollywood, and I'll just say pedophiles, Richard Donner. But uh, you could also take it as one-eyed Willie was at the head of the table, meaning from the right perspective, beginning at the end where Mikey came through through the trapdoor, is looking up from the base of the Kubrickian monolith to the illuminated top, or the Star Wars text crawl, or Cecil B. DeMille in Paramount Studios with the Mount Sinai and Moses. It's all the illuminated top. Look at the back of your one dollar bill. One-eyed Willie, the illuminated one. Head of his uh, table lodge, <laughs> his game group. He's the master. Um, but what the, it's inside the barn is, I, um, I'll just read what I have, okay. Zelda looks around with, uh, it's, uh, oh god, there's too much text. There's all sorts of treasures and boxes. Think of the, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark warehouse but mixed with a Santa's workshop. It's just like uh, all sorts of knickknacks hinting at all kinds of things. Um, and you could even put, if you could get permission, things from other movies in there, like uh, uh, 
let's see, what could you even put in there? Oh, I actually had access to a prop that had been made for local school where we were going to have our soundstage. Uh, an H.G. Wells time machine. You could, <laughs> in the background, way in the back behind his boxes, maybe with a half, half a dust cover over it. You could have uh, boxes from Roswell. You could have anything in a Jumanji board laying there gathering dust. You know, all sorts of what the hell is really she going to find in here? And she finds in the back, and you could light this all kinds of ways. I pictured a backlit thing. A big dust cover over it is the the boat, a little wooden boat, specifically eight feet long by four to five feet wide, depending on the hull to bowsprit. The bowsprit, I think the mast when set up was nine or ten feet tall at most. Uh, I'd like to say 11, but maybe with the flag it reached 11. Uh, and it's got a big cover over it, like a big Christmas present that she's going to unwrap, and it's lit from behind, so you can see the silhouette of the ship. And so she starts tearing off the canvas, or whatever covers it, like she's unwrapping the ultimate Christmas present, and the light intensifies. Now what's really going on is that she has really crossed into Wonderland already. Whether in the ancient, you know, medieval times you had stories of fairy kingdoms where the children, the hill would open up and the child would be lost or they'd step into a fairy ring, like a crop circle. Maybe there could be a crop circle. You know, it'd be a, I just thought of it, a cool shot would be when Zelda passes the scarecrow and heads towards the barn, get a drone aerial shot that there's actually a crop circle in the field. And since we had permission of the field, we actually could have stamped one. I mean, we'd have to hoax a crop circle, but... We'd let everyone know, obviously, this is for a movie. And, um... <laughs> so that would tell the audience, okay, she's clearly in, you know... Baron Von Trump going through... He seeks a mountain and the giant's well at the top of the mountain. Now, giant, meaning Nephilim, those who came down from the stars, and a well can be either reflection, like a, a reflecting bull... Mount Sinai. Sinai means reflection. Egypt up is down, remember. And uh, everything about the Ten Commandments, in my opinion, is getting in touch with God through your pineal gland. That's why it's the illumin Moses gets the illumination on top of the... Or basically, if you think of the mountain as your head, it gets... What, what's at the top? It, with the pineals. And you, you need to, anyway, um, he's not at the peak. He's up on the mountain's side, remember. He's kind of inside it. Frodo with the ring in Mount Doom, the Arkenstone of Erebor, Lonely Mountain. But um, she's in that other world now. And she's seeing a lot of what she wants to see. We see a lot of things from her scrapbook. And in this point, now that she's in the barn, a claustrophobic maze-like place. She's passed so many stacks of boxes she can't see the doors she came through. She's sort of in the middle of this world and can't find her way out, visually, metaphorically. And then the hat man arrives and confronts her. Now you have a subtext sort of like child rape going on here, but that was not my intention. But that would be terrifying to people, I admit. It's really just the boogeyman has cornered her. Anyone who's had a nightmare knows that you don't want the boogeyman to catch you. Well, he's caught, he's cornered her. It's not just a rat in a trap, it's the boogeyman's guy. Oh, God, you know. So that's the nightmare theme I was playing on. And what he does, ultimately, in case I make this, I won't spoil the scene. I mean, I'll tell you what happens, but in little details. I don't want to give too much away. He kidnaps Calypso. Now, what's really going on here, the hat man, he kidnaps Calypso and vanishes into the shadows. And then the whole barn goes dark, and Zelda's left crying in the dark. If aliens, alien abductions and things have long reported how the greys and others are curious about emotions, and I, I would imagine any other world entity, from the fairy tales of old to modern UFO reports, there's always this fascination with human emotions. Or, Cal Calypso is something that Zelda's put enough of her heart into that it's, it's basically alive to her consciousness. And so the hat man, the aliens, are curious, like, what is this thing? Can we learn from it? You know, obviously there's a comical misunderstanding, but that's characteristic of the men in black. Witnesses say they show up and they ask, 
for food and they, they don't know how to use a fork because they're you know they dress out of time hence the old car the Model T they don't quite get it you know they're when in Rome do as the Romans do but that's easier said than done especially on a cosmic level much less just a you know human to human is easier than people out of time and place literally uh, trust me I know from experience uh, Marty McDemille no, Mar Marty McMill, Marty DeFly, Marty Skywalker, say I. Bumping around the makes no sense name of itself, Hill Valley. What a paradox. Old Doc Werner von Braun would say about that. Montauk, sorry. Spinning a consciousness is a got a loose wheel here. Um, when I was making this movie, I was given many warnings by shadows. 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 And to make a long story short, while this movie will have a happy ending, mine kind of didn't. On the very anniversary of my fiance leaving me, July 26th, I had my. Because I didn't obey the warnings, I had. Ultimately, it led to my own cat getting taken from me and not coming back. Shall we just say that cat went flat? on the road what a wonderful way to spend the anniversary of your fiance leaving you <laughs> uh, and then there's other human victims as this story goes on but we haven't got to them yet um, so maybe that's why I'm spinning a little bit here um, I can sympathize now more than when I wrote this of Zelda losing her beloved cat dragon her familiar Uh, although in this case it's a misunderstanding. In my case it was sometimes uh, well Yoda would warn against letting your emotions get the better of you. That leads to the dark side. So what's Zelda left to do? Well she was older like me she'd smoke. So, kind of in the opposite of Peter Pan, where they get the flying ship at the end just to sail home with, covered in golden pixie dust. I, I get my, my green pixie dust going early. Uh, now, Zelda, what she does is she activates the pirate ship, which I guess in a crude way, if you were to strip away the illusion of the Matrix, means on board the UFO she found a control panel or something <laughs> but in her mind what we see in the movie just like Calvin and Hobbes Calvin and Hobbes has a cardboard box but it becomes a spaceship or he, he has his red wagon that flies to Mars Zelda has this pirate ship that she found in a barn and you're already wondering is the ship even real because you had the old guy you know uh, Mr. Mason <laughs> Mr. Freemason Mm. If I film this now, maybe I could... Well, I still have access to that property, but I could add a Freemason temple in there somewhere up now. <laughs> maybe. No, no, actually. But, uh... Mr. Mason, you wonder if he didn't build it? Or is she our... Is the ship... Is the pirate ship even real? Now, the prop was real. We built that. We actually toured it in a couple parades... Uh, we didn't advertise that we had already given up on making the movie when we put it in parades, but uh, you know, it was real. Uh, and that's what would help sell the illusion. Everything that Zelda believes had to be a physical prop so that the audience believed it. Because she believed it. You get me? You were taking you on this journey with her. I want to match your consciousnesses as, <laughs> as close as possible. Or should that just be consciousness singular? Ultimately, probably is more accurate. Uh, now, 
when she gets on board the ship, it glows, and this will be the cinematographer's wet dream, because I'd just say, just make it as wondrously shiny as, bring out all your toys, I want, I want you to go through all your gels, I want you to get all your expensive toys, you know, film it five different ways from Sunday, and we'll have fun in the editing room. We'll make it psychedelic. I was picturing something close to the uh, Stanley Kubrick 2001 Ascension, you know, something very colorful and bizarre. Not just a flash of light, not just falling into a room or something, you know, there had to be a journey here. Now, she doesn't know how to sail the ship, and she's sailing it alone, which is important. This is the first time she's ever alone. She doesn't have Calypso. Which means her consciousness is askew. She doesn't have a rudder for her mind. And she doesn't sail very far before she runs the ship aground in the darkness. Now, we had a wonderful soundstage to use at a local private school where both my father and, for a few months at least, myself are technically alumni. And we went there and we got a, a permission to use it. They liked the script. They had an art department of students that were ready for film experience. They wanted to start a film division, and here was DeMille from Hollywood, alumni of art department. I had all the volunteer PA service, extras, crew that I needed. And this is where we got the H.G. Wells time machine. We were <laughs> They had already built it for something. Anyway, the soundstage was beautiful. High ceiling, had a grid. The walls were already blacked. It was soundproof. It was brand new. It was like built five years previously. It was br big wide hallways with double wide access doors, plenty of bathroom, and empty rooms off to the side for, for break rooms, for wardrobe. Ah, oh, it was a filmmaker's dream. Had it ready. It had it all permission. And here's the best part. Not only did we have access to all this, it was for free. Zero dollars. You hearing me on this? So naturally, I was going to film about a third of the movie in this, including all the outer space scenes. No green screen. When she is flying the ship through outer space, the void of her mind, the darkness. Darkness is ignorance. you got to wonder about Baron Trump's underground adventure. What is the underground? Well, there's been an underground railroad, and Freemasonry is technically, for many centuries, was underground. But that didn't mean the temples were underground. They're buildings built generally on top of the ground. The one I, the, the lodges that I attend are built on top of the ground. So is the whole underworld adventure a metaphor of self, you know, realization, enlightenment, illumination? Because it does end with the crystal rock, big one eye window over the city frozen in martial law, really. Baron Trump's adventures which he must uh, break on through to the other side the exodus same thing uh, flying through the darkness uh, the, the time bandits darkness is ignorance that's why the fortress of ultimate darkness requires the map to get out and when, what was the first thing that Evil does when he grabs the map from the Time Bandits? When they, he fools them with his maze and he puts them in a cage, a cube, a box, the most mechanical thing imaginable, symbolically? He walks up the steps to the light. Anyway, uh, in, in Flying Through Outer Space, I intended to have Zelda not on a green screen but on a stage because it had a lot of space, all darkness, so we'd have a natural darkness, and then we would hang things in the darkness. I was a student of Disneyland, Space Mountain. A lot of Space Mountain's illusions are like just little mirrors hung on wires in the distance, so the wind naturally spins them and they glitter like stars. Simple things like that. We had a grid in a huge black stage. Oh, with a little eight-foot pirate ship? Put that in a little gimbal? You know, just have someone off camera with a big stick rocking it around? And a smoke machine and some lighting. And the glinting, ah, oh, it'd have been magical. But eventually, she brings the ship to uh, to rest with a bump. She doesn't quite wreck it, but maybe she bumps her head. 
and she, you know, fade to black. When she awakens, it's daylight, exterior, stream, lost and found town, day. Zelda awakens. Her pirate ship is moored to a dock in a shallow stream along a peaceful forest riverbank. The dock is the same scale as the ship. Cartoon accuracy. Zelda looks around. A miniature village on the riverbank. It has a storybook feel to it. The only monument that stands out is a bell tower in the center. The size of a man at most. As in Nazi bell tower. <laughs> Glockenspiel. Montauk. Time travel. A closer look reveals the town is built from all sorts of odds and ends. It is a town of toys, lost and found. We see Flint, a living teddy bear, this is who Jason Marsden was going to be the voice for, walks along the riverbank, oblivious to Zelda's presence. Flint, as in Flintlock, a gruff, piratey bear that's seen his fair share of battles and has the stitch work to prove it, but he's a coward at heart. Think Chewbacca, but like teddy bear size. Uh, he wears a headband and carries a flintlock pistol and a whip. He's a standing proud at two feet tall. Zelda thinks he's cute, and there's a, there's the sort of Gulliver's Travel mistaken thing. He's like, oh, and he runs off to ring the bell. Oh, sound the alarm. There's a trespasser. You know, he thinks he's brave by sounding the alarm and gets everyone else out there to fight. And then he's like, all right, now yeah, we're ready for you. Arr, arr, arr. Scrappy do, you know. <laughs> And uh, Zelda's like, I'm not a pirate. And he's like, you're on a pirate ship. And he says, oh, no. It's a Gulliver's Travel type of uh, thing. And um, there's, of course, a bit of Dorothy in Munchkin Land because all the teddy bears come out. And this would have been a big puppeteered thing. The, te the teddy bear town would have been built in such a way, uh, think Dark Crystal. There just would have been ways to hide a number of puppeteers for some wide shots and then a lot of close-ups would have been easier to film because people, you know, just cut off the, you know, framing below the waist of the puppets or the stuffed animals. Um, and then in um, trying to fight off Zelda, the teddy bears call upon their armada and several small galleons sail up the river behind her pirate ship and we had these built, or no, I mean, we had these already made. They were the castle, which I will, the castle of the the princess who fell to the scourge of the New World Order, cancer. Or, no, the scourge they gave us, I mean, of meaning they gave it to us. Um, the lord of that castle had many hobbies. Amongst them was building all kinds of models including ships that were full-scale replicas, several, like, two, three feet long. You could use them in a movie, pirate galleons. But they also had water cannons built in that could squirt water, like, four or five feet. So we had this scene planned out where they were going to flank the eight-foot little pirate ship with the little girl on it and squirt water at her, because we had all this built and ready to go. It was ready to film. We just needed cast and uh, crew, but the, the art department was done. And, of course, Zelda realizes they can't really hurt her. And she, you know, they try grape shot with grapes and, you know, comedy stuff. And uh, she wins him over and they mistake uh, Flint. He's like, uh, they realize they can't hurt her and he's uh, got to be like brave. He's like, what? You, what? You, you dare to defy us, see wench. And she's like, wench? Witch wench and witch, you know, because she likes, likes to be a witch, and they mistake her for a wench, and we can play on that. Uh, she gets the best of, of Flint, <clears throat> and then lets him go. Uh, she's got the size advantage for the first time in her life, so she knows not to be the bully. So all the teddy bears of Lost and Found Town, and all the lost toys... It's not the Lost Boys, the vampires, it's the Lost Toys. <coughs> they realize that she is a friend, and she is what the bullies have not been to her. So she had, the whole, through the whole movie, she's got the good heart 
That's Calypso. That's They are one. Her good heart. And that's what the aliens can't figure out. That's why they're studying her in this big rat in a maze scenario. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, she mentions Mr. Mason, just like in Baron Trump, he mentions Don, and they know, some recognize, ooh, you're a friend of Mr. Mason. So if you're a Mason, you're at the inside. Maybe you have the secret handshakes with the teddy bears. And uh, she explains what happened, that the hat man, and then of course, ah, then all the teddy bears run into the little houses and their little windows bang close. A lot of puppeteering work, but it would make for great, you know, once it's edited together, it'd look great. And it's like, ah, but the, at the end of the day, you know, she needs, to, I need to go rescue Calypso, who will help me? <clears throat> and of course, at the end, just like with Baron Trump, he goes on alone with only one his faithful dog, Bulger, or Bulger, however you pronounce it. Flint, the pirate teddy bear, will prove his courage, and he will go with her on this adventure to rescue Calypso. And they rename the ship, rechristen the ship Calypso. And so the quest for Calypso is on, as Zelda and Flint set off into the strange Alice in Wonderland, just like Baron Von Trump down... Well, first, Baron Von Trump they and Dorothy go down a, a brick road. In Dorothy's case, it's yellow brick. In Baron Trump's case, it's white marble. In my case, it's a river the whole way. But Baron Trump does, in the second, he, like all of them, they go through a series of kingdoms. In Baron Trump, in the second kingdom, he, switch, he ditches the road and gets on a boat of exactly the same proportions. Eight feet long, five feet wide. Now his is made from a turtle shell that he defeated the turtle and it's kind of gissed up like a, a Lord of the Rings swan boat from uh, Lothlorien. But mine's a pirate ship. But it's still the little child with the fuzzy companion on the eight foot long boat going through Wonderland on the journey of enlightenment. Now I wrote this script in 2012. The Paul Baron Trump story hasn't come to light until... July uh, or August of 2017. Five years later. I have to point out, even though I've said it before many times, it's important. I am a Montauk boy of 1983 vanishment with witnesses along what I called Mirkwood Road. And I was a designer of role playing games, so Stranger Things for Real. Channeled the upside down the realm of the darkness, including the highwayman, as I call him in my lore of Fantasia, the novels, that is, and he's a good guy, the highwayman, the hat man, the man in black, but it's that upside down world described in Stranger Things, which my hero, and read the novels. Donald Trump and I share a birthday, June 14th, Flag Day. Donald Trump's uncle started the family fortune by helping cover up the Tesla papers, which is the Montauk technology. So in other words, Trump's fortune comes out of the Montauk project, which is Stargate manipulation of this matrix. Baron Trump, very similar name to Darren, my brother who fell to the dark side. And uh, I have some resemblance to Baron Trump of the same age. Uh, although Baron Trump has larger eyes, which doesn't really make sense for Donald Trump's genetics, nor even uh, Melania's when you look at it. Baron Trump's got round eyes, and Melania's got those sharp, elven, wide, almost alien eyes. Anyway, it's all the same blood, uh, that Atlantean race, that Nordic, European, Skywalker race, the blood, the DNA, 88 the Roslyn column, which I worked into my thesis not knowing what it was on Indiana Jones. <laughs> didn't real, didn't know anything about DeMille or the Ten Commandments or Masonry at the time, but I ended up being a Mason. <coughs> DeMille, the mountain, the father of Hollywood, the paramount of illusion, or of in, illumination. <laughs> illusion, if you only see the two-dimensional movie screen, you got to see three dimension, other dimensions, new dimensions, like my game company. Fantasia, see what you want to see. Cecil B. Mason, Ten Commandments, Masonry, Temple of Solomon, Raiders of the Lost Ark, my thesis, work, 
the DNA blood column awakening, the Montauk throne of the gods atop the illuminated mountain I set in New Schwabenland, Antarctica, not knowing anything about that either. Just made it up. Shall we continue? As they're getting the boat ready to go on the journey, we see a few other oddities in Lost and Found Town, including a junkyard of time machines. Amongst other things, the lord and the princess of the castle had, and thus we had access to. In their garage, amongst other things, was a fully functioning, pretty much mint condition, he was a collector of odd things, DeLorean. In other words, a time machine. Perfect. We could have driven it, we could have used it, we could have done anything but wreck it. No, granted, it didn't have the Back to the Future dressings up, but believe me, as an art department guy, and if he would have let me... And he was, okay, yeah. Give me a couple of days, and I would have made that a thing It looked decent, give me a week or two, and I had a year to prep. I could have made that DeLorean Back to the Future worthy. Perfect. We put that next to the H.G. Wells time machine. Maybe have a broken Stargate. That'd be easy to build out of styrofoam and wood and stuff, you know. It was a junkyard of time machines in the lost and found town, which I thought was just a wonderful art. And they're kind of shopping through it for parts. The, and the junk makes it easy to hide puppeteering so the teddy bear Flint can follow Zelda, our actress, along just fine while they're looking for parts to get... They're sort of arming the ship. The Calypso pirate ship needs some cannons and... So they're looking for stuff, and oh, the ideas, the possibilities are endless of things that sort of jury rigging. Let's take this, let's take a, an odometer or two, some of the gauges off of H.G. Wells' time machine. Let's take the flux capacitor off. Now, we couldn't literally take the flux capacitor for copyright reasons, but we just take junk, and you see, the, you see a DeLorean in the junk lost and found. I don't even need to dress it up. You see a DeLorean there, it's going to make the connection in the audience. You just cover the back of the, the car with the junk, so you don't even need to make the exhaust ports and stuff, or Mr. Fusion. Just have it obscured by half of a tarp. Yeah, no problem. So they dress up the ship to be like battle worthy for wonderland and so they got a cannon a swivel gun mounted that the teddy bear holds it and says it's more than just a squirt gun <laughs> <laughs> there's a little teddy bear being threatening with this mounted squirt gun you know oh it'd just be i i thought it would be uh it could easily make this for all audiences so it'd be marketable uh could be released in summer for fun or for holiday because of halloween theme and you know, the teddy bears is always cute. Oh, Santa's sleigh. There's going to be a Santa, a Santa Claus sleigh amongst the junk time machines. So they could take some parts off of that, too. Get some uh, reindeer dust, get some pixie dust, and and have the, the teddy bear flint mix it all up in their uh, cauldron. They could have Mr. Cauldron or something on the pirate ship. All right, uh... They talk about Hatman, they realize what they're up against, and they sail off. Now, around here in western Washington, we have plenty of little rivers uh, where we could take the pirate ship, and it was not a floating pirate ship. I mean, it was a prop. It would, If you put it in water, it would sink. But you don't really need to... We were going to build a track for it, like a 30-foot track that we could take to different locations. So all you need is just a little bit of movement, and with the camera on its own track, going counter to it you can accelerate the movement look at the panning shots of lord of the rings you know kind of make you dizzy but it makes the fellowship look like they're going at a walking speed when they're really picking their way carefully along those cliffs uh and we could make our ship look you know and then with cuts and close-ups you, you can make a 30-foot track look like they're sailing along a river and you change scenery and you know, So, where is she going in this wonderland? Um, let's see, what do I have in my script? Well, jokes about root beer, root bear. They're loading the ship. You can't have rum and beer so much because it's teddy bears and things. Uh, so they have root bear. 
get it. <laughs> I thought it was funny. But it's also Halloween. So Flint brings aboard candy stuff. It's not beer. It's root beer. He doesn't bring aboard rations. He brings bags of goodies and you know candy. And off they sail. Obviously, Zelda and Flint have to build some trust. Now, there's a slight departure there from the Wizard of Oz or Baron Trump in that Dorothy trusted Toto implicitly and, and little Baron Trump t trusted Bulger implicitly. Whereas, I have a sl slightly different story, I admit, but eh, it's not everything's the same. Boys and girls are not all, you know, Hey, sailing along a peaceful stream, river. Uh, fog. Maybe have Hat Man off in the off on the side. You know, just a panning shot. Was he there? Was he not? I think the beginning of Pirates of the Caribbean, the ride when you're looking at the fireflies in the shack and you hear the banjo music. You have little things like that. Um, Maybe test fire the cannon and have it either not work or do something harmless like uh, shoot confetti or just smoke. You know, make a joke. Yeah, it blows smoke and, and then Zelda's like, you're just, you know where you're going or are you just blowing smoke? And Flint's like, oh, he's insulted. Huff, huff, huff. But of course he can't do anything about it. <laughs> he, can just, he can just be really put out. Let's see, sailing along, building a character. Now, eventually, we start to introduce, we see off in the distance, another pirate ship, the Iron Skull. This is like the haunted pirate ship that's pursuing Zelda. If, if, if the Matrix movies with Neo and Agent Smith were set not in 1999, but they decided to reboot the Matrix, say, in the 17th century. Agent, the, the agents would be, maybe they'd be like pirates and have a pirate ship. That'd be a cool movie, wouldn't it? The Matrix is a period piece, with Agent Smith, Hugo Weaving, being a pirate. <laughs> anyway, that's what I had going on here. And the Iron Skull, let me just let the script speak for itself. The Iron Skull lurks at the edge of nightmares in silhouette. Small fiery lights can be seen aboard in small in skull-like casings. Are they lanterns or ghosts? The Iron Skull is a relatively small pirate ship like the Calypso, but 13 feet long, 18 feet with the bowsprit, made of pipes, gears, cogs, all crude machinery, but somehow elegant, very Victorian. Its maiden head is an iron skull of some bizarre demonic dragon figure. From this iron skull extends a bowsprit in the form of a horn, capable of spearing other ships. The bow itself is vertical, like a row of spikes with a row of spikes protruding forward. But perhaps the element of the ship that stands out most of all, in place of sails, are an elaborate weave of chains that have an electrical current jumping from chain to chain anchored to six Tesla coils in place of deck lamps. The electrical spider web of sails sizzles and hisses like a devil's choir. Clip, clop, something big is approaching. <laughs> <clears throat> that would be Ironbeard on the deck. And he calls out to the Calypso. And he knows Flint from the past. Suggesting Flint the teddy bear has a shady past as a pirate. And Ironbeard, of course, would not hesitate to turn Zelda in to the Hat Man as a ransom in this matrix. Of, uh, <clears throat> perhaps to get himself set free. Anyway, Zelda and Flint uh, 
depending on budget and time, there can be an interaction there or just a, they run away. There were several versions written. Sort of saving Ironbeard for later, if necessary. And sometimes it's usually best. You know, don't have the big action scene yet. You save up for it. Uh, they sail on and they come to uh, the riverbank where Zelda leaves Flint ashore and she goes up a hill to Stonehenge which I mentioned we were going to film along the uh, the river here and uh, here's where she meets the fairy queen or equivalent in Baron Trump the first act he meets Crystalla Crystalia the uh, the crystal queen really now the person I had set to play this was Mary Votava. You might know her from Stan Lee's uh, Who Wants to Be a Superhero as Monkey Woman. Now with all due respect we became friends in LA to the point where we went to Disneyland that is we four of us her boyfriend Jem and my fiance Jessica and I went to Disneyland a couple times and she gamed with us a couple times I game mastered for uh, Mary, Jessica, Jem, and um, Matt Vansel, an old uh, acquaintance, was there as well. Didn't last but a month, but uh, in Hollywood terms, that's pretty good. <laughs> Schedules are hard to keep, and parking is a bitch. But um, we were friends. And shortly after I left L.A., she left L.A. for her own reasons. And when I was putting this movie together, I asked her I said would you even though you've left the movie business would you be considering you know doing a little more acting and she agreed I sent her the script she liked it I, I renamed the character after her so the character was named Votavia uh, and she was it was gonna be one day of filming that was it you know uh, maybe two but it was it was really just the uh, giving advice character and the interesting parallel is that in Baron Trump, the Crystal Queen, there are many parallels to my own Fantasia novels, uh, the character of Crystal, that is her name, who is the what I refer to as the Scarlet Woman. Now, Mary, in real life, is or could have been Scarlet number three. So there's lots of synchronicity going on here, you see. Time is an illusion. And that's basically what Votavia tells Zelda here. She sort of sets her on the right track. And I was considering doing Votavia, even though we would have her on set, I would not green screen this, I would double image this. I would do a, a static shot, or if the computer, they had good tracking technology, I could do a panning shot. But I would film a background plate of Stonehenge, which has nice, very hard lines with the standing stones. And we'd do it on a still night with no wind, if we could. And uh, Votavia, Mary, um, film the scene in the same place, but then just double image it so she'd be transparent, just sort of ethereal, and maybe add some mist and fog and lightning, uh, lighting. You know, just anyway, that, I, I thought she'd be uh, beautiful, Mary. Um, she has wonderful eyes, these almost alien, they're very large, but in a good way, eyes, and they're green. I mean, if I was casting a proper Dungeons and Dragons movie, and there was an elven female warrior, I would cast Mary Votava, because she's got the face for it. She's got the slightly different features, which I think are... Uh, better than your Hollywood typical platinum blonde. She's got cheek the sharp cheekbones and the, the the sharp almost anime eyes and it just if she she would have been a beautiful fairy princess, uh just oh well. Didn't happen. <clears throat> uh, and uh so Zelda leaves Stonehenge knowing that 
she's got more power than she realized. You know, she's got that boost. Oh, I can do this. I can do this. That sort of stuff. Okay. Let me on. They're sailing on. Scene 37. Um, sailing down the river. Flint lights a pipe. It illuminates the cabin of the Calypso. <sighs> you see, like Snoopy's doghouse, which I hinted at earlier, even with a gimmick, even the joke prop, it echoes what happens later. It's, psycho it's psychology. Movies are psychology, or they should be. Anyway, we're in the cabin of the Calypso, so it's, and it's a full cabin. This would be a set. And Zelda and Calypso are just sitting on a big bed, kind of, what are we doing, you know, where are we going? The ship's driving itself. It's a magic ship. What matters is that Zelda has the compass of her heart set right after Votavia helped her. And the ship is just an extension of her consciousness. So she doesn't need to be at the helm. Uh, and of course Flint's like what happened up there what happened up there and uh, Zelda's a little hesitant you know she's sort of just taking in the wonderment of all that's happening we look around the cabin it's uh, as uh, Flint smokes and drinks and behaves now mo some people will bring up the movie Ted with the smoking wisecracking teddy bear I've never seen those movies I don't care to because I saw the previews and I saw it was crass. What I was trying to do with this was trying to be more charming and cute, you know, more absurd. Um, Hollywood is a sick place. I was trying to actually tell a, a story with a heart. In a way, since Zelda was missing her normal conscience, Calypso, and Flint was the surrogate conscience, he was flawed which is part of a coming-of-age story. People lean on each other. They find the flaws in each other, and they grow together. He was flawed. He was doing everything a child is told not to do, smoke, drink. But since he's a pirate, Jack Sparrow paved the way for that, so it would have been marketable. You know, you, you, I don't mean like in merchandising marketable. I mean you can sell it to an audience. You can actually get people to accept it, and you can market it. Pirate. Anyway, uh... And there's various conversations that Zelda and Calypso have of that sort, like, she's like, how can you, how can you drink? Well, I'm a pirate. And that's sort of like a Toons thinking, you know, Roger Rabbit can only take his hand out of the handcuffs because, when it's funny, but he can't do it any other time. Flint can smoke and drink because he's a pirate. You, you see the logic, I mean, very cartoony logic, child thinking. Uh, it's a movie generally made for children, and I wanted the movie to be an outlet for children who have more and more children, star seeds, indigos, crystals. They're all waking up. The mass awakening is ongoing, and I wanted a movie that would speak to those those children and those emotions, something sort of familiar to them that spoke to their subconscious, if not to their conscious. Although I think everyone, I think pretty much most audiences would like a Halloween -y pirate ship time traveling a steampunky adventure that goes to the moon that could be fun uh, anyway they're in the cabin talking about what's going on and um there's a lot of bookshelves in this captain's cabin because it's it's kind of like her bedroom but a more stylized version uh and they're drinking root bear floats Take a little jab at strawberry ice cream if you know UFO lore. Um, 
I'd be kind of like the line in the Matrix where everything tastes like chicken or whatever. And uh, it's Flint's like, everything is strawberry ice cream in these parts. Kind of hinting to anyone really wise in a Kubrickian way. We're, we're in UFO turf here, folks. But, um, Zelda says, and uh, she figures out, they puzzle out Votavia's riddles, and that back to the beginning of the movie when Zelda and Calypso are looking out the window, do you think people really live on the moon? So when Zelda has been asking Votavia all these, where do I go, what do I do? And Votavia is kind of like, you have to look within yourself and, you know, what a, retrace your own steps. What have you already, you keep a log book, a scrapbook, what is already in your own notes? And so her and Flint pour through her scrapbook and, you know, because it's in the library in the captain's cabin and they figure it out. She's already got the wisdom in her head, because all this is happening in her head, in a way, in her consciousness experience. And that is that the moon. Calypso is being held captive on the moon. So we got to sail to the moon. And there's no need to explain how do you get to the moon. It's a Calvin and Hobbes. Get in your cardboard box and sail to the fucking moon. That's all you need to do. Sorry for my language. Um... Anyway, so now they're they're because Zelda and and uh, Flint worked out this riddle. They're sort of bonding. They're getting over their differences. And Flint's good at reading clues on papers, or so he claims, because he's a pirate. He can read treasure maps, and of course he he fucks up. <laughs> he's not that good, or does he fuck up on purpose? Oh, teaser. He does have a past with Iron Beard, you know. <laughs> Oh no, yeah, grim fairy tales. So they fly it uh, into outer space, and there's all kinds of misadventures they can have along the way. We have our sound stage to film outer space, character bonding moments. Uh, I was thinking of anything from, uh, you know, kind of Star Trek type adventures where they come to a an asteroid and they find a forest oasis, and inside is like her old home and everything was back with Calypso in the way she wants it to be and the hat man shows up in the garden and sort of like the snake in the garden of Eden he's just the hat man in the forest and he's telling her you don't need to sail on you can have Calypso back and it's, it's sort of like saying the aliens are a little afraid that they can't fool her that they can't frighten her off and therefore it's got the Halloween motif she won't be scared and they're like how do we stop her so they're, they're getting more desperate and she's like, you're not going to fool me, Hattie Man. And, you know, because she's already been encouraged. And you get the idea that there's like a, as is in reality, which is why I felt the film would be important, that even in the fairy world or the, you know, the, 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 conspiracy, the Big Brother, New World Order, there's all these infightings. I got to imagine there'd be good entities that would want Zelda to succeed, just like there'd be the, those trying to shut her down. And they're all the opposites, you know. Votavia is all in white and colors, and she's a lady, and then Hat Man is all in black, and he's a dude, and he's creepy, and, yeah. Um, Flint raises his pistol at Hat Man. We get this tense moment, like, you make, make Flint actually do it. You know, he's, so everyone's characters are developing along the way. And Zelda has her internal angst. They're trying to break her heart. They're testing her heart almost in a mechanical way. She's so emotional, but, you know, so they're studying that. She's like a lab rat. But she's seeing it in terms of, you're trying to, you know, frighten me. You're not going to succeed. That emotion that aliens can't understand. Is they're all technological, so goes the theory. Where, uh, but that's applicable to any time and space. You know, it's uh, it's always the metaphor. It's what's within you. Uh, eventually, they um, they have a battle with the Iron Skull because they won't be deterred. They won't be driven back from the moon. So you got a bit of the shining room 237 going on there 
in the whole secret space program. They don't want us to go to the moon. So after uh, Zelda and Flint sail on, they're getting close to the moon. Ironbeard is back aboard the Iron Skull. And of course his pirate ship is twice the size and it's got the chain lightning rigging. And, and now Ironbeard is uh, sort of like uh, Davy Jones. I'll admit there's some Pirates of the Caribbean Davy Jones in there. But it's a lot of other things as well. Um, think the Borg from Star Trek. Think uh, Steampunk. Think uh, even Dr Count Dracula. What I was picturing for Ironbeard was like a robotic Davy Jones. This horrific, uh, un uh, horrifically unnatural thing. Instead of tentacles for a beard, he would have uh, hoses leaking steam and he could have you know, all that studded leather for his pirate gear the victor steampunk stuff he could have gears and gadgets and cogs off the side of his head and oh it'd be a hell of a costume and makeup uh tour de force and his ship would be this sort of gotham city pirate ship with all these uh, uh pipes and um gaskets and you know tesla coils and things there'd be nothing of a pirate ship about it. Instead of being crustaceans and barnacles for a Davy Jones ship, it would be all Victorian-era machinery. And I had spoken to, and another person that had agreed to help with the movie to some degree, although it never went past negotiate, but he was interested. And he was still living in Vancouver, B.C. at the time, I believe, was John Hutchinson, known for the Hutchinson effect, anti-gravity and all this Tesla coil energy. He worked on the Star Wars program. Dan Aykroyd covers him in his uh, Unplugged on UFOs video from 2005, which is where I first learned about him. We corresponded by email, and I was going to build the ship for real, you know, out of metal and weld it, and we were going to, you know, old uh, parts of junkyards. We were going to, like, spend a year building the ship, and we, so the you could... We would, we would add CGI lighting effects, but we would have some practical on set as well. We would have real Tesla coils on the ship, and so when, like when Ironbeard would follow, fire a volley of cannons and they would shoot magical energy, the volley of energy from the cannons would probably be CGI. But the Tesla coils and the chains on the ship sizzling, and maybe arcing or something, and casting the lighting effects across the hull and... So that would be real. That would be live in camera. That was that was what was going to be. That was one of the few props we didn't build because that was waiting for budget. And uh, actually, the Hat Man thing was happening. Budget wasn't even a concern. Casualties was a bigger concern. But. We have access through shipyards and through friends, military, people with old barn... You know that show, um, American Pickers, or where people drive around and buy junk? Some of the people that we were had set aside to let us use their property, friends of family, we had the raw materials to build the ship. Cost wouldn't have been that much of a problem. It was more the expertise to do it right. And I don't think he could have done worse than Hutchinson. <laughs> um... Anyway, the uh, the Iron Skull attacks and, of course, overpowers the Calypso. And there's a, a desperate battle. Uh, Flint uh, cowers and, you know, there's some true colors shown there. And, and ultimately... Uh, they, they manage to... Uh, get away just long enough to uh, crash land on the moon. Uh, Flint is hurt. But he's saying, I want you to reach the moon. Kind of, we worry that you know, Zelda's stitching him up in the cabin. Literally stitching him up because he's a teddy bear. Instead of bandages, she's stitching him up. And he's like, you gotta get to the moon. You gotta rescue Calypso. And so we, you know, add up the drama and the bonding of the characters. And it's still a sign that 
Zelda's heart can give life to anyone, even to the the you know salty past uh, pirate teddy bear. Uh, as they're in Zelda, Zelda's heart is now shaken, so the ship is uncertain, and so it starts to rattle, and and Flint's like waves his paw get up on deck to the helm you gotta steer the ship safe so she leaves him in the cabin and she goes up on board the smaller the little clips of ship and she takes a little helm and she tries to steer it but it's symbolic of she doesn't have much control now she's you know she's she's saddened there's been damage done and as she's sailing over the moon she's looking for a good place to crash land <laughs> just like in the beginning you know and here's where i was going to tease some of the other UFO lore like uh, Jay Widener in Room 237, Richard Hoagland, all kinds of stuff talking about crystal pyramids and ancient ruins on the moon. And you get like a POV of the Apollo capsule flying over the surface. You can do it with a miniature. And she's looking for a place to crash. And they mention, Flint mentioned, Flint mentions the Black Manira Sea. And this is out of the, the, the Calypso's book of extraordinary place. You know, the, the, her scrapbook from the beginning. She starts to remember her own notes. And now she, she remembers the maps. Because Flint says, you remember them much better than I do. Admitting that earlier on he, um, you know, he professed to read better. You know, no more than he did. But she knows. It's all about her. And so she remembers her own writings, and they find a decent place to crash land. And they do. Now we come to the beach. This was a location we had, friend of the family, and I'll say right now, is one of the casualties. Now what happened during this movie is that for a while we were gung-ho on making it, and then bad thing, bad frame of mind, whatever, it was shadows lurking the edge of my experience in this matrix and since I couldn't steer myself very well I knew I shouldn't have made this movie I was on the wrong path it wasn't meant to be made as I emphasized in my 2013 testification I didn't know what that meant at the time but I didn't take it as you're not allowed. It's like it wasn't the right point in the time stream. It wasn't right to make this movie. But I kept pushing ahead. Now, there were signs. When I went to this location and to others, including the castle, which I had been to before and this had never happened, I have a phobia of snakes. It goes back to my childhood and meeting things of not of this dimension. Uh, it's in my separate testification. But I don't go where they are. I don't chance it. The PTS is bad. Indiana Jones, you know? You gotta be afraid of snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? As we're going out to this beach, which is where Calypso has now crashed, I was assured they won't see a snake, and of course there was one right there. Just And it was just like a sign, that, like a black cat. You're on the crazy path. Now, the owner of this property, or, or his family, but... The, the contact himself, a longtime friend, we're talking high school friend, same school where we were going to use the soundstage. Both the owner of this beach, uh, the friend from high school, and the stage manager of that stage, both were struck down. One with... No, nah, that's getting too personal. They're The friend of the family with the owner of the beach, he's dead now. Just like the princess of the castle is dead now. Just like my cat is dead now. And the stage manager might be dead now. Last I checked, it was not good. Now, over the year and a half or two years that this project went on going, I would... It would go for a while, then it would cool off. Oh, it's not going to happen. In perfect sync with this, every time the project cooled off, multiple if not all four of these people that I've mentioned would I would get news within a few days oh cancer's in remission stage four in remission oh but then months later something would happen oh we got this location were you sure you want to go ahead on this movie well yeah let's push it 
Ring, ring, 24 hours later. Cancer's back. Now you might say, oh, you're not responsible. I'm not telling you everything on this. Believe me, I take some responsibility. And the moral of the story is to anyone out there, don't fuck with Hat Man. If you're not supposed to go down a certain path or a certain river, and you try, you will crash your ship on the rocks. And while the captain of that ship might not go down with it, some of the crew might. And that's still blood on his hands and on mine. This went all dark suddenly, didn't it? Well, we're into the, getting into the end of the second act. It has to get dark. Zelda crashes on a beach, a dark gravelly beach. Now this property that we had access to was here in Puget Sound on the leeward side of the over-industrialized area. It was over in western Puget Sound, west of Gig Harbor, Bremerton, that area. Which meant filming at night would not have been too difficult because there's not there's still a lot of uh, trees and not a lot of uh, houses and restaurants along the, the coast in that area. We had a mile of beach, private beach. It looked gravelly just like the rock quarries where we would film the moon landscapes so it would match. We had a pre-built shanty town that would take minimal art department redressing to make it look like a pirate town on the moon. And the idea was these pirates, and we had friends with lots in the pirate community, lots of wardrobe of pirates, were going to be like a Beetlejuice waiting room, a purgatory for the dead, or a purgatory of souls lost in material excess, hence pirates. And just because I like pirates. And so does Zelda and hence the pirate ship. But we were going to have lots of extras of pirates and old gnarly characters that sort of been uh, a circle of Dante's Inferno, of hell, greed, excess, external things. Borg, a bunch of zombie, robotic, alien pirates. The art department, makeup, wardrobe, go wild. Uh, and Zelda has to blend in, pretending she's like one of them, and this makes for awkward, spooky scenes because she's clearly not one of them. And her and Flint have to emotap, emotap. <laughs> and um, but they don't do it very well. They get captured. And ultimately, Zelda. Everything goes bad here. This is where everything goes to hell. Iron Beard shows up. Everyone's confronted. Um, the Iron Skull is in Docking Bay 94 or a hangar bay nearby and this is where you can cut to something just like we've already established that on board the pirate ship like Snoopy's doghouse you can go indoors and it's a large interior so do you go inside one of the pirate shacks close the door and you're inside a hangar bay underneath the beach just like um, that potential hangar underneath uh, Zuma Beach or whatever it is out in Malibu in California, the UFO entrance. And then we're seeing them pop up all over the world now on Google Earth and such. So Ironbeard and the pirates take uh, Zelda to on board. Now we finally see below decks the, the Iron Skull. And we could might slip in what a piece of junk as she's being dragged on board, but she's strapped into the chair Inside her cabin on board the Calypso, we have a bed, soft, suggestive, but soft. And then on board the Iron Skull, we have no bed. Iron Beard does not rest. We have a Montauk chair, a dark crystal gelfling torture chair, so to speak. And here, uh, all kinds of Victorian steampunky gadget. You know, the wall. It's like a alien hive tomb of Victorian Gotham City torture chair for children and total nightmare total black and white set Zelda's the only color right in the middle of it her heart and the cinematographer be instructed to put some extra luminance on her especially on her heart you know just make it make her face and chest glow and um hat man is there and he's sort of like I did my job and then he leaves sort of ambiguously 
We don't know quite what's going on with Flint. He's captured. He's in a cage. Now, there are many rewrites here. I don't need to get into the details. It would work itself out if it were ever made. But the general idea is the characters start to turn. Flint starts to want to redeem himself because he kind of led them to her to pay off an old debt, kind of like Han Solo. <laughs> Questionable character and Hat Man. You know, pirate. And, but Hat Man's also starting to question how come we cannot break this little girl? This light, this this magic of emotion, of love that she has is so strong. It's even affected you, little pirate teddy bear. You're just, a, you know, you're now feeling regret. You never felt that before. Fear, yes, but not regret. You know, it's that sort of, both of them are starting to turn. And uh, Calypso is shown to Zelda in the chair to get her to cooperate. Hatman squeezes the cat dragon by the throat, you know, and I'm going to rip it apart and you'll tell us and how do you give emotion to this and it's really just aliens trying to figure out human love but they're going about it all wrong um, there's an escape of course Flint has to make the daring escape and he helps Zelda escape and then they retrieve their ship and there's a chase to the hangar bay very Star Wars docking bay 94 ish and uh Maybe a little bit of Jack Sparrow disabling the Iron Skull. Maybe causing a, a short out, you know, Flint, I don't know maps, but I know how to this or that. And he hot wires it to all fry when they turn it on, cross the chain. Don't cross the streams. He aims all the cannons and chains at each other. You know, he fucks up the Iron Skull so they get it, they have a getaway. And then they, they, um, so they can't be chased, but they can't get the Calypso going again. That's right. And they have to uh, make their way far, far, far. But they finally are getting to the finale. Um, and that would be the castle of the aforementioned princess and lord. I had filmed there before. Um, I'll just say Mud Hollow. That's a fitting description for the... Uh, people involved in that film uh, in some ways uh, but um, oh there's a scene in here I forgot um, I'm sorry before Flint sells out Zelda to be captured there's a, a scene in the Model T with Hatman and Flint talking like gangsters making a deal and so since we had the car to film with, and you can easily film a puppet in a car, because uh, you just have the puppeteer sitting on the floor of the car, you know. It's just a gang, you know, you have the camera in the driver's seat, filming the two gangsters in the back seat. That type of deal. And, uh... Some of the pirates start to wake up and help, others don't. So you're, you're establishing forces for the finale. They make their getaway... And then they come to the castle, which is the castle of the king and queen of Halloween who live on the moon. Now this was um, uh, the real castle location was a friend of a family who spent 11 years building it. And it had the DeLorean in the basement, but the exterior and interior, well, it wasn't really a facade, it was a castle all the way through, had... You know, hundreds of weapons lining the walls, arched doorways, suits of armor, everything inside. Stone floors, oh, was, you know, wood ceilings, it was great. The exterior, though, was five stories, five stories with towers and uh, beautiful, you know, stained glass windows. It, it could have passed for a church or, as we filmed it before, a tavern in a fantasy world or a little castle. It suited me perfect to have it the castle on the moon. Now, how, now it was surrounded by trees, but I was going for the moon, more fairy tale Victorian era moon. And like I mentioned, Richard Hoagland and company have described crystal pyramids and things. So I was going to have a little forest on the moon and spooky forest. They now we know we've come to the right place, and that's easy enough to do. And now the front of the castle has a village we, we have a row of built little huts and things and um, space uh, roads we have space to stage a fight so this is where the big schma the big finale was going to happen 
basically Zelda comes in and kicks in the door and, you know, I want Calypso back, and then the King and Queen of Halloween are there. I'll read you the description from scene 82. Interior, throne room, night. A large hall. Amber light glows everywhere. From lanterns and magic, mostly. Dead thorns wreathe around columns and the vaulted ceiling. Chains once hung a chandelier in the center, but the thorns have overtaken it, given it an evil appearance. Thick rugs of black, orange, and golden weave cover most of the floor. A fitting chamber for the king and queen of Halloween. And... The hat man is there, sort of like the court advisor, uh, worm tongue in Lord of the Rings or something like that. And the king and queen being played by the same actors as Zelda's parents, it's all in her mind, remember. Halloween's what she wants to see. Now the set we had built, or it wasn't built, but it was planned to be. We had the stage set up for it. Um, was going to be built in sections that were all flyaway. They were all um, wild walls, as the saying goes. They were all flyaway pieces. And there was going to be a coordinated thing like a dance to where in camera, as the scene unfolds, as uh, Zelda's talking, and sometimes in long unbroken shots of a couple minutes, panning 360 degrees, the, the set would transform. And it would the as she's saying, this is an illusion, I don't believe you, you can't fool me, I want my kitty cat back. The Halloween castle would disappear and would reveal the lunar moonscape all around, which would simply be dunes of gravel on the soundstage behind the flyaway walls. And again, this would take coordination, but it could be done. And um, amongst the... Uh, uh, the true, the aliens have given up the facade. They're like, okay, no more illusions. Here's the truth. The, the green curtain. Toto pulls down the green curtain. The Wizard of Oz is exposed. That scene. And so it's not a Halloween castle. It's the moon. But you can exist here, as is more likely than not with the secret space program. There's actually more gravity and atmosphere on the moon than they want to admit. Not as much as Earth. It's an uncomfortable place, but you can survive there. That's why all the Apollo missions uh, footage is BS. Stanley Kubrick, some people at AFI. I have commentaries on that elsewhere. But um, I added a Stonehenge of green crystal monoliths and standing stones. I was fascinated by the green crystal rock type stuff. Sort of like kryptonite Stonehenge. Uh, or as Zelda built it, out of Legos. Those little green see-through Lego blocks, I, I built a Stonehenge out of those. Maybe literally, like at the end of Time Bandits. Have big transparent plastic green, uh, blocks of green uh, acrylic or something and have green light shining or have different colored lights pulsing through them like thoughts, like rainbows, like the spinning room at the end of uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull when the portal, the vortex of higher consciousness is opening. Now, the king and queen are not a king and queen at all, but they turn into a mechanical dragon, which would have been an articulated puppet. Easy to do. You build it out of junk, and you have black wires. It's on the moon against the starscape, a black sky, with a grid. Puppeteers. Easy. In camera. And uh, this, this is where it gets a bit of an action scene, where she has her witchy powers, her little Zelda, Legend of Zelda sword and stuff, and she overcomes the dragon within herself her fears and I don't want to spoil it too much in case we end but the point is it's very similar to in fact it's almost the identical ending of Baron Trump's underground adventure where the police state of the frozen people who need to break on through to the other side as I said by destroying the great rock crystal window the one eye in the sky that allows the only light light in well, they do it first by splitting the pineal, of, uh, not splitting the pineal, splitting the ice like the Red Sea around the monkey or the chimpanzee, similar to freeing the pineal of the evolving man, if you think Darwinism of the 19th century when Baron Trump was written. But more than that, um, it is Bulger the doggy, Baron Trump's little dog, that shows so much kindness that he starts to melt all the ice and he starts to warm up and bring life 
And that's what Calypso, the cat dragon, does. Because Zelda is so much in love, just want my kitty back, that's it. It overcomes the aliens in it. Like Terminator 2, he starts to understand emotion. Even Hat Man gets a tear, you know. And then the king and queen are like, um, what do we do? Well, we have to let her go back. Well, then no one's allowed to know what really goes on. And it's like, well, she's not like the rest of them. She's awake and, be, you know, just like Baron Trump is reborn. And just like Indiana Jones, they all get jettisoned out the, the tunnel at the end, like a birthing canal, back into the overworld, the so-called real world. Um, there's a big battle where the pirates and the teddy bears and everyone from Lost and Found Town and everyone, you know, there's a big fight just like in Wizard of Oz, you got to have flying monkeys and chases and things. But in the end, it's just the heart that sets everyone, you know, everyone on the right path. And they talk a bit about the police state, and you know, there's all these lies in the world, and you, you know, um, the aliens defend their position a little bit, like how we have to be veiled because some people are not ready to understand us. Um, even as you try and translate to your friends your experiences through your pictures, your scrapbook, your costuming, your cat dragon, so do we with our illusions try and communicate as best we can with your world and your lower consciousness, so to speak, referring to humans. This is the gist of the dialogue. And um, I'm sorry, I'm telling this badly. Of course, in the battle, Ironbeard is defeated. and Yeah. That's, that goes without saying. And then everyone's happy at the end, and they, uh, um, get the ship ready to sail again back home. We even had a dock built out front of the castle, on the ground, so it was on a road, so we just put the boat on rollers and it'd roll away. But that'd be like the leaving Oz, everyone waving goodbye type of thing. And that would have been um, where the second movie could have taken place. It was going to be a Christmas theme, so we'd redress the Halloween castle area with a Christmas type of thing. And uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm telling this really badly. It's not so much a dragon she fights at the end. It, it, there's another note uh, that could be a sphinx as well symbolic of overcoming the mystery of the ages and learning what really lies and so the lion's gate you know that's right <clears throat> this script was never polished to finish so there's a few awkward notes and I haven't looked at it in years um, throughout the movie there's use of the term as above so below the aliens kind of talking down, or you know, the fairies talking down. At the end, Calypso reverses it. She's in, or he's in the arms of Zelda, getting on board her ship, ready to fly back home. And uh, Calypso says, "As below, so above." Please understand what it means to love. And of course, they leave the aliens with something to think about, and the message is we can all learn to get along. Uh, and then as we fade out the movie of course back uh, back home they can look up at the moon again and they know there's more out there than we're being told and playing on the fake moon and stuff um, let's see the last scene scene 94 interior Zelda's room daytime Zelda draws in her bellatristic journal while Calypso sits on the bed next to Zelda, quietly watching her work. Insert. Flipping through the updated journal, we see images of Flint, Mr. Mason, Hattie Man, and other elements from the journey, all well preserved in mythology, glorified, embellished. In Zelda's world, Elves and aliens are one and the same. The veil between dimensions is thin. Herself and Calypso are the only things to remain unchanged. Final picture. 
Only a raw, unfinished sketch of the Calypso boat. Doodles about the paper show possibilities that she might draw. Moons, mountains, dragons, etc. But only thin lines yet. The Calypso... You know, it's, it's, there's more to come. And then she looks up at the actual Calypso, the cat dragon. Well, Calypso, where should we go next? Calypso needs, like a cat, purrs cuddles into her lap. Maybe we should just stay inside. And then they look out the window, at the moon, and it starts snowing. It's Christmas time. And Calypso asks, um, uh, I won't spoil it. Got to leave a few things in case I ever make it. But that's the story that I tried to make five years ago. If you read Baron von or Baron Trump, um, and think of all that Montauk lore I mentioned, birthdays, similarities, parallels, the fact that I said Trump would win from the beginning and I'd never supported politics before. It's because things had to happen. As we wrap up in the final section here, tying up loose ends, I don't. I used to think the project was cursed or haunted, and there was enough pain going through my heart at the time that that could have been part of its manifestation. Certainly everything I went through in Hollywood and the persecution of my friends did not help the situation. So I, don't, I take some blame, but certainly not all the blame. Could people have died by sheer coincidence and all this? Oh, we're all recovering. Oh, now we're all not. Oh, now we all we are again. Oh, now we're all not. Is it a coincidence that the tides of the ocean ebb and flow with the phases of the moon? Hmm. I backed off the project, and what more could I do? And I've quietly and sincerely always asked the shadows for the understanding that it's simply part of the larger story. Um, and that seems to be okay. Because it's about what's ultimately important now. The whole world's coming to terms with this Baron Trump book now. I wonder what would have happened if I had pushed the timeline four years ago, five years ago, to be this false version of this. Oh, sure, I could lay claim to money. Oh, look, I had the movie first. But maybe there's an impact from this Baron Trump thing that has to play out in a certain way that the 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 hat man or whatever is going on, the men in black, the adjustment bureau, is another good movie to cite. They sort of guide things in a way they need to go. Now, did they have to kill people? Maybe they didn't. Or maybe in the timeline where Trump is president and we don't have World War Three, those people are dead. But if I stayed in the timeline where they lived and I made this movie, Hillary would have been president and everything would have went to shit anyway. Uh, if you're familiar with Star Trek Next Generation, think uh, there's an episode in the one of the earlier seasons, second or third or f some. It's an alternate dimension and only Guinan Whoopi Goldberg remembers echoes of the other one. And one of the important crossover points is Worf is dead, and um, I forget the character's name. Denise Crosby, is it? Uh, the security lady that died in the first season of Star Trek. Um, she's back, and she's like, I never died. You know, <laughs> Worf? What the fuck? That's how I feel my life is, that if I had pushed for something selfish, oh, I could have been an entrepreneur, I could have made this, oh, sure. And maybe Baron Trump would have shown up later. And I could have cashed in. But what's that going to prove? But I can do what zillions of other people have done throughout time. I can be greedy and powerful. and Oh, I can take this gift of insight and pervert it into gain. No, no. Borrowing from Stan the Man Lee, the mentor, the Yoda of Mary Monkey Woman, with great power comes great responsibility. I walked away from the project because, as I said in my testifications at the time, that it wasn't right, it wasn't the right timeline, it wasn't right to do this. 
I'm starting to wonder in a Mandela sort of way if the Baron Trump books would have existed at all if I had done this movie. It's like, it's only so many gimmicks that can be doled. I've used this comparison before, WrestleMania, wrestle, or any wrestling show. You don't let everyone brawl into the audience. You don't let everyone use the chair. you got to have variety, and they all agree ahead of time on a good show who gets to do what. I don't think this movie, Calypso, was allowed in a cosmic sense to be made on a more, if we're going to be in a dimension with a more important thing like a real president with paranormal backing. And you know, in the end, being tied through the Montauk Project is a, it's a deeper rabbit hole. I, to borrow from Jim Morrison, I'm off movies, man. <laughs> I've found greater things. Last page of the script. Uh, anything you want to say? Uh, I'm sure some people will be saying, "Oh, you're just making it up, seeing what you want to see." Well, that's what the Montauk Project is: manipulating the Matrix as we see fit. I have the blood DNA code for it, and have all kinds of synchronous connections. You wouldn't. Yeah. Well, listen to all my stories. You'll get the gist of it. In the last page, even maybe as a cookie, credits fading out, we see the journal. The images show Hatman returning. Returning. Many of the lost and founds to their earthly homes. Zelda hides the journal 